This is the sixth and final lecture in the series Capital, the Productive Process, and the Rate of Profit. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, of necessity, uh, there are some topics that I would very much like to get into, which I'm going to have to omit, uh, and some that I'll have to go over more lightly than I would like. The three things that I want to be sure to go into uh, is the relationship uh, of net investment to the rate of profit, and then uh, why it is that there can never be a problem of a deficiency of consumer demand, why it is that business will not, never be in the position of uh, trying to spend more for capital goods while the consumers are spending less for consumer goods and that that should somehow create a problem. This is a question I raised in the uh, description of the lectures that you all received. Can business be in the contradictory position of trying to spend more to buy capital goods at the same time that the consumers are spending less to buy consumer goods. I'll show that this happens, but there is no contradiction, there is no problem in any way connected with this. And the final point that I want to be sure to cover is why savings out of income can never outrun the uses for savings, why we never have a problem of savings surpassing the use for savings. And the implication of that and the uh, point about uh, no problem of a lack of consumer spending, uh, this has major implications for what does and doesn't cause depressions. The implication is that whatever may be the cause of depressions, it is not a problem of lack of consumption or an excess of saving. And hopefully from previous lecture series you know and, and from this one, too, that it is never a problem of too much production either. All right, well, to uh, try to explain the role of net investment in connection with profit, let me ask you once again to turn to figure four on page 19, and specifically to year two of figure four. Now, in year two, as in all the other years, the total sales revenues of business are 1,000, comprised of 600 of spending to buy capital goods, plus 400 of spending to buy consumers' goods. Profits in year two are 200, because the total costs deducted from the 1,000 of sales are still 800. There's 480 of capital goods cost. The, there's 1.2K of capital goods that have a cost value of 480 in year two. There's 0.8C of consumer goods that has a cost value of 320. When you add those two, that's 800. You deduct the 800 from the 1,000, you have 200 of profit. But notice, what is net consumption in year two? Net consumption in year two is not 200, it's only 100. We have uh, spending for consumers' goods of 400 and wages of 300. Dividends are 100. So net consumption, consumption minus wages, is only 100. The excess of sales revenues over productive spending in year two is only 100. Sales revenues are 1,000 but productive spending is the 600 for capital goods plus the 300 of wages. Sales revenues exceed productive spending by 100, but profits are 200. Well, we've got, I've been telling you all along, profits are determined by net consumption. They tend to equal net consumption. In the way I've developed things, they very, very quickly do. But here is a case in which profits are greater than net consumption. Profits are 200, net consumption is 100. What accounts for the difference? Well, what accounts for the difference is that while productive spending is 900, 
costs are only 800. There's 900 of productive spending, 600 for capital goods, 300 for wages, but costs are not yet 900, they're only 800. Why are they only 800? There's the lag. Last year, productive expenditure was 800. It's last year's productive expenditure, which is this year's costs. Now, to the extent that productive expenditure is greater than costs, profits are greater than net consumption. Profits are greater than the difference between sales revenue and productive spending. There's this further difference. To whatever extent productive spending is greater than cost, that adds to profit. Now, this difference turns out to equal net investment. The difference between productive spending and costs is net investment. And you could notice this even in figure four. In figure four, in year two, what is the total cost value of the capital goods and consumers' goods possessed by business? 800. What's the total cost value of the capital goods and consumers' goods possessed by business in year three? 900. This is not an accident. Every time business spends money to buy capital goods or pay wages, that expenditure is added to the value of the non-cash assets it owns. If business spends money to buy a machine, the purchase price of the machine is added to the plant and equipment account. It's added to the value of assets that business owns. If businesses buy inventories or pay wages to workers to produce inventories, those expenditures are added to the asset inventories. When business sells goods, it has cost of goods sold. The inventories are being reduced by the amount equal to cost of goods sold. That's what we have in figure four. When you have costs of 800, you're selling assets with a cost value of 800. If you're spending 900 to acquire new assets, and your costs are only 800, well, you're adding 900 to assets and subtracting 800. You have a net gain of 100. That's net investment. If businesses, or a business, if a business spends a million dollars to buy a machine, and the machine lasts 10 years, the cost that it will deduct from its sales this year is not $1 million, but only the depreciation on the machine probably just one-tenth corresponding to the 10-year life. So if, if you spend a million dollars to buy a machine that lasts 10 years, and this year's depreciation is 100,000, what has happened to your assets? They've increased by 900,000. You've added a million dollars in a machine, you have depreciation of 900,000. Correction, 100,000. Suppose you have machines from past years, and the total depreciation on all the machines you have is 600,000 for this year. But you're spending a million for new machinery. Well, what are you adding to your assets, and what are you subtracting? You're adding a million, you're subtracting 600,000. The net addition, the net investment, would be 400,000. And this would serve to represent an equivalent addition to profits in the economy. The million of spending for the machine shows up as a million of sales revenues. But what's the costs? The associated costs are only 600,000. To the extent that productive expenditure exceeds costs, we have net investment in the balance sheet, we have profit in the income statement. To the extent productive spending is greater than costs, there's a net addition to assets in the balance sheet. The productive spending constitutes sales revenues. Those same costs are a deduction from sales revenues. There's a, a component of profit corresponding to net investment. Now, um, this component uh, is contributed to by the increase in the quantity of money and volume of spending. If you look at figure 3A, On page 17, 
what's happening to productive spending in each year starting in year two. It's going up, but the costs do not immediately reflect the higher productive spending. We have this lag. So in every year of figure 3A, there's going to be net investment. In every year, productive spending exceeds cost because the costs reflect the lower level of productive spending of the year before. And over in table six, I have a column that I didn't previously refer to labeled I. It's toward the center. That stands for net investment. And it's derived from the difference between productive spending, B, and costs, D. So in year two, productive spending is 880. Costs are 800, reflecting the lower productive spending of year one. And there's an increase in the monetary value of the physical assets of business in the amount of 80. In year three, productive spending rises to 968. Costs rise to 880 there's net investment of 88, and then the, in the following year, 97. Now, the increase in the quantity of money and the increase in the volume of productive spending year after year after year operates to perpetuate net investment. Costs will always lag. Costs always reflect earlier productive spending. The depreciation that businesses charge this year in their income statements reflect expenditures to build factories, buy machines, stretching back over previous decades, even generations. Imagine that a company has a factory built in 1950, and it's been depreciating this factory over a 50-year period. Well, this year, if you read its income statement and you read the item depreciation, some part of that depreciation will probably reflect 2% of the purchase cost of the factory constructed in 1950. So we have costs showing up today that go back over decades. And much of today's spending won't show up as costs until years later. If we're first constructing a 50-year factory now, some of that cost won't show up until uh, 2039 as depreciation. So there are these lags. Now, if the quantity of money and volume of spending were fixed, if we had invariable money, there would always be a tendency for productive spending and costs to be equal, sooner or later, because costs would always ultimately catch up with productive spending. If the quantity of money and volume of spending are growing, however, uh, costs will not be able to catch up. Now, I could go into this in further detail, but I'm uh, moving fast. I just want to acquaint you with the notion that there is more in connection with profit than the rate of net consumption. The rate of increase in the quantity of money can be uh, expressed as influencing the rate of profit by establishing a rate of net investment. It adds net investment to profit each year. It makes Profit consists not just of net consumption, but this further excess of productive spending over costs. And if we wanted to express uh, net investment divided by capital invested, we'd find that it tended to equal the rate of increase in the quantity of money. The rate of increase in the quantity of money adds to the rate of profit in connection with perpetuating uh, net investment. All right, as I say, uh, more discussion would really be necessary, but uh, I just want to make you aware that there is this further factor. Uh, productive spending differs from costs. Typically, it is greater, and to the extent it is, that is a component of profit over and above net consumption. But it's a component that would disappear, ultimately, in the absence of increases in the quantity of money and volume of spending. So in an economy with an invariable money, net consumption would be the sole 
uh, long run determinant of the rate of profit. We may come back to this uh, a little bit later if necessary. All right, the question I'd like to turn to now is this question of uh, can business be placed in a contradictory position of the consumers, of, of it uh, spending more to buy capital goods uh, at the very time the consumers are spending less to buy consumers' goods. Is this a contradiction in any way? This is the doctrine of under-consumptionism. The under-consumptionists say uh, business is in an inherently contradictory position. We want the consumers to consume less to make their savings available to buy capital goods. Now business will have to spend more for capital goods but how is it going to do this profitably? The consumers are spending less for consumer goods. And people might think, uh, if business is spending more for capital goods than the consumers are for consumer goods, it's locked in to an inherent loss-making position. Imagine the consumers are only spending 400 to buy consumer goods, and business is spending 600 to buy capital goods. Does this mean that business is spending 600 to take in 400. That's the way it's viewed. That they're locked in inherently into a loss-making position. They're spending 600 for capital goods. The consumers are only spending 400 for consumer goods. Well, there's a fallacy in that. But you could never see the fallacy if you have the contemporary approach of regarding the output of consumer goods as being the whole output and regarding the spending for consumer goods as being the total of spending. <clears throat> if every year we have 400 of spending for consumer goods and 600 of spending for capital goods, there is no problem. Most of the 600 of spending for capital goods is not deducted as a cost from the 400 of consumer goods. Most of it is deducted as a cost from next year's 600 of spending for capital goods. And that's the figure. We've been working with this right along. No one has seen a problem yet. Maybe you first started to see one a moment ago. But uh, if you look at figure four, every year, regularly, the spending for capital goods is greater than the spending for consumer goods. And every year, business is profitable. Well, how does that work? Is it the case that the sales revenues of business are just 400 and they have to deduct all the productive spending from what the consumers spend? The sales revenues of business are 1,000, not 400. The spending to buy capital goods is just as much spending as is the spending to buy consumer goods. The spending to buy capital goods in any given year is deducted not only from next year's consumer spending, but from next year's spending for capital goods. And we could have a much more extreme situation. I deliberately construct an artificially extreme situation on page 24 in table 7. How the demand for capital goods can far exceed the demand for consumer goods. <laughs> And I imagine we have a series of years. Every year is going to be uh, the same. We start in year n, year n plus 1, 2, 3, ultimately n plus n. And in every year, I'm imagining sales revenues are 1,000. And the demand for consumer goods, D sub C, is only 100. The demand for capital goods is 900. I'm making the demand for capital goods drastically in excess of the demand for consumer goods. Now, how can business sell for more than it buys in this context? Well, if the only source of sales revenues was consumer sales revenues, the 100, they couldn't. They'd be spending for 900 and selling for 100. They'd be locked into an 800 loss. But sales revenues are not 100. Sales revenues are 1,000. Next year's 900 of spending for capital goods is just as much sales revenues as the spending for consumer goods. And what would happen is, uh, 
just as in figure four, but changing the numbers, each year's 900 of spending for capital goods would be deployed, 90 of the 900 would be spent to produce next year's consumer goods, which sell for 100. We only deduct 90 of the spending for capital goods to produce next year's 100 worth of consumer goods. What do we deduct the other 810 of spending for capital goods from? Next year's 900 of spending for capital goods. The sales revenues are 1,000, not 100. And now, in this table, I work it out further and show what specific expenditures for capital goods are getting deducted from what. This year, we spend 90 to produce the consumer goods of year N plus 1. In year N, in year N we're spending 90 under the heading DK1. That's the spending for capital goods to produce the consumer goods. We're spending 90, and I draw a downward sloping arrow. The 90 will be the capital goods cost of producing the 100 of consumer goods sold in year two. Now, in year two, we have to repeat that same process. In year two, there's not only going to be 100 of spending for consumer goods, there's going to be 90 of spending for capital goods to produce the consumer goods of year N plus two. Well, don't we have to produce the capital goods of year N plus one that will produce those consumer goods? In year N, we have to produce the capital goods of year N plus one that will produce the consumer goods of year N plus two. And how much do we have to spend for those capital goods? 81. Now in year two, won't we have to have spending of cap for capital goods of 81 to produce the capital goods worth 90 in the next year, which will produce the consumer goods of the year after that? I, well, what we, ha what we have here is an infinite series. And if we add up uh, all of the different outlays for capital goods in any particular year, they'll add up to 900. But each portion of that is devoted to the production of a particular portion of capital goods in the following year. And the total process uh, runs in a way that the sales revenues exceed the outlay for the capital goods. So this is a deliberately extreme case, but it illustrates the principle that we could even have an economy with just 100 of consumer spending and it's adequate to support 900 of capital goods spending. Most of the capital goods spending would be devoted to the production of capital goods. So there's only a problem if you think that all of the capital goods spending is a deduction from the receipts from consumer goods. But most of it is a deduction from the receipts from capital goods. All right, now uh, we may have time to go in briefly to what I refer to as the average period of production. And I say all production is ultimately a production of consumer goods, no matter how great is the relative production of capital goods. And we can see this uh, largely on the basis of the uh, ideas we've just been discussing. If you turn to figure five on the next page, 26, it's an exact replica of figure three, but with a few more arrows. <clears throat> now, notice In year one, we use half the capital goods and labor of year one to produce capital goods for year two. And we use half to produce consumer goods for year two. <clears throat> if we stop our analysis at year two, then half of the capital goods and labor of year one have been used to produce consumer goods for year two. Half the capital goods and labor of year one have produced consumer goods for year two. 
the other half have produced capital goods for year two. But now what happens to the capital goods of year two? Half of them will be used to produce consumer goods for year three. Well, let's focus on the half of the capital goods of year two that produce consumer goods for year three. What proportion of the capital goods and labor of year one produced the half, that half of capital goods? 25%. In year one, half the capital goods and labor produced consumer goods for year two. 25% of the capital goods and labor of year one produce half the capital goods of year two, which are going to be used to produce consumer goods for year three. Now, if we extend our vision from year one through three, what portion of the labor and capital goods of year one serve in the production of consumer goods by the end of year three? 75% because half the capital goods of year two serve in the production of consumer goods in year three. If we went a year further, what portion of the capital goods and labor of year one would end up serving in the production of consumer goods by the end of year four? 87 and a half. And if we go a fourth year, it'll be uh, 93 and a quarter. The further we go, the larger the cumulative total of the capital goods and labor in any base year that end up contributing to consumer goods. See, we produce capital goods, but then always some portion of the capital goods produces consumer goods. So some portion of the labor and capital goods that produce those capital goods indirectly contribute to consumer goods. Now, ultimately, if we went, if it, if there's a tendency for uh, if we look long enough, all of the labor and capital goods in any base year, ultimately, we, we get closer and closer to 100% contribution to production of consumer goods. 50% of the labor and capital goods of year one produce consumer goods for year two. A further 25% produce, help to produce consumer goods for year three. 12.5% more for year four, on and on and on. Now, this is true no matter how high is the relative production of capital goods. Suppose we, uh, we apply this analysis to figure four, which I do here in figure six. In figure six, 60% 60 of the capital goods and labor of year one produce capital goods for year two. 40% produce consumer goods for year two. But of those capital goods, what, ha what happens to those capital goods produced by the 60%? 40% of them are used to produce consumer goods and 60% to produce further capital goods. All right, what is 40% of 60%? That's 24%. In figure six, by the end of two years, the cumulative contribution to consumer goods production is no longer just 40%, it's 64%. 40% of the labor and capital goods of year one produce consumer goods for year two. Of the 60% that produces capital goods for year two, 40% produces consumer goods for year three. The cumulative total going into consumer goods is now 64. If we carry it further, well, 60% of the capital goods of year one produce capital goods for year two, of which 60% produces capital goods. And of those capital goods, 40% produce consumer goods. Well, if we apply 40% to 60% of 60%, I believe we get 14.4%. Um, Ultimately, 100% of the capital goods and labor in figure six, we asymptotically approach 100% of the capital goods and labor of figure six serving in the production of consumer goods. But it'll take a longer time to achieve any given percentage. Like if we ask the question, how many years have to go by before 90% of the capital goods and labor of a base year show up as consumer goods in figure five rather than figure six. 
Well, in figure five, it's 50% plus 25% plus 12 and a half plus six and a quarter. I think that's uh, four years. It's, it, it's four years shows up 93 and a quarter percent, or 93 and three quarters percent will have shown up uh, contributing to consumer goods in five years, in, in uh, less than five years. In figure six, it takes longer to achieve the same percentage. In figure six, more years have to go by before 90% uh, of the labor and capital goods of a base year have contributed to consumer goods. So we could say figure six represents a longer period of production than figure five. In figure six, more time has to elapse before there is the same uh, ultimate contribution to consumer goods. We can interpret the concept of period of production this way. All right, let me ask you a question. Is it necessary for the period of production to lengthen to have capital accumulation, to continually lengthen? Is it necessary for the period of production to continually lengthen to have capital accumulation? The period of production of figure six is longer than that of figure five, but does it continually grow? It's stable at a longer length, but it doesn't have to continually lengthen. You don't need a continuous lengthening. Uh, you, it's the same issue as do you need a higher relative production, a continually higher relative production of capital goods for capital accumulation? No. Uh, a higher relative production gives you acceleration a longer period of production would give you acceleration. This, incidentally, is another uh, error of Rothbard, if you uh, happen to read him. He thinks you need a continuous lengthening, but uh, you don't, in fact. The lengthening would achieve uh, acceleration. All right, uh, there are implications of this, which I just don't have time to develop. Uh, I wanted to indicate the idea to you. The main thing remaining that I want to be sure to discuss is why uh, savings can't outrun the uses for savings. Let's briefly uh, consider the scope of the uses for savings. Uh, we need savings to adopt more capital-intensive methods of production, namely using machinery instead of uh, hand methods, uh, assembly lines, uh, having uh, bridges and tunnels. There are different ways of uh, constructing railway lines. You can have railway lines that uh, make detours or uh, have large uh, initial capital expenditure to build tunnels and bridges. Uh, there are many industries that are more capital intensive than others. For example, housing is a highly capital intensive industry. Uh, electric power production is highly capital intensive. Railroads are highly capital intensive. There is a tremendous difference among countries with respect to how capital intensive they are. The United States uh, is one of the highest capital intensive countries. We employ a high ratio of capital invested to sales. The ratio of capital to sales in a poorer, less advanced country would be a lot lower. Within the United States, there are individual firms that are more capital intensive in a given industry than others. The most capital intensive could become still more capital intensive. There are uh, potential uses for capital uh, far beyond what we're capable of accumulating. For example, right now, they're first constructing a tunnel under the English Channel. This is an extremely costly project that will require a great amount of capital investment. <clears throat> now, it would be technologically feasible in the present state of technology, you could construct a tunnel from Britain to Denmark or to Norway. Uh, you could construct a tunnel from Japan to South Korea or from Florida to the Yucatan Peninsula. 
This is within the framework of technological uh, feasibility, and it might very well be the case that the volume of traffic that could be generated and the savings of cost in having to unload things from railways and trucks and onto ships and then uh, unload them again, uh, it might very well make such investments profitable. But what stands in the way? Think of the amount of savings that would be required, the amount that we'd have to be prepared to expend each year for many years to construct these things before we got a payoff. And we don't have sufficient savings to do that. Now, there are, we have a vast potential outlet for uh, savings and capital, but the problem is relatively limited abilities to accumulate the capital. Uh, let's think of the capital that might be accumulated by wage earners, the extent to which wage earners might save and accumulate capital, and what, uh, to what extent they, they would be motivated to do this. Now, I would say the average wage earner uh, regards his future ability to earn wages as the source of providing for his future wants. It's his future ability to earn wages that he looks to, to providing for his future wants. Now, wage earners save mainly to the extent that they fear being unable to earn wages. Either they'll be too old and will need money to live in retirement, or they might be sick, so they'll have a motive to save in order to provide for periods in which they're unable to earn wages. They have a further motive to save to buy things that are too expensive to buy out of one pay period. Like if you want to buy an automobile, most people can't do that out of a month's paycheck. They have to save for a while. Certainly if you want to buy a house, you have to save. Wage earners are motivated to save, to buy goods that are too expensive for any one pay period. They're motivated to save to provide for their old age and periods of accident and so forth. Well now, I think that all of the savings that wage earners could reasonably be expected ever to want to accumulate, there is an outlet for that merely in housing. All of the savings that all of the wage earners could reasonably be expected to accumulate could be used without great difficulty just in housing. And let me give you this simple example. You know, it's a, a supposedly a rule of conservative personal finance that an individual should try to limit his expenditure for rent or housing to one-fourth of his income. All right, let's imagine we have someone with an income of 100, and he's prepared to spend uh, 25 for rent or servicing his mortgage. All right, imagine uh, that 15 of this 25 represents the interest on the mortgage or the profit of the landlord. Imagine 15 out of the 25 represents the interest on the mortgage or the profit of the landlord. If the rate of return on capital, if the rate of profit is 3%, how much capital is supported by this 15 amount of profit or interest? 500. Well, now just think, here are wage earners prepared to spend one-fourth of their income on housing. If 15% of that represents the interest payment or the profit of the landlord and the rate of interest were 3%, well, there's room for 500 of capital. Now, what's the ratio of that capital, those accumulated savings, to the worker's annual income? It's five years accumulated income. Now, if we imagine a worker when he's just starting out, he doesn't have any savings, so he's uh, one person and someone else who's reaching retirement. If the average is five, if the average savings of wage earners can be five times their income, how much can someone have at retirement? Ten times his income. 
Well, I'm indicating to you, most people today do not have anywhere near 10 times their annual income when they reach retirement. But there is room for this volume of saving just in housing alone. So uh, I think there's no difficulty uh, of coping of the economy finding ready uses for all the savings and more, much more, than the wage earners could ever hope to accumulate. Well, the only other source of accumulated savings is profit. There can never be excess saving out of profit. What is it that always limits saving out of profit? Net consumption. Now, as uh, to, for whatever time profit is greater than net consumption, well, we have net investment going on, as I tried to explain earlier. All right, what happens as net investment takes place, as accumulated capital builds up? As we have capital building up, What's going to happen to the relation between costs and productive spending? Imagine we have a constant level of productive spending. It's ahead of costs. What will be happening to costs? They'll be rising toward productive spending. As people accumulate more capital and they have greater accumulated wealth, what will likely be happening to the amount of net consumption they feel they can afford? That'll go up. Well, now, if we have costs rising toward productive spending and net consumption going up, tending to bring productive spending down, what's happening to net investment and the saving out of profit? It's going down, and, and it comes to an end. If we had an economy with a constant quantity of money, what would happen is saving and capital, saving would occur, capital would be accumulated up to a point people would achieve a certain ratio of accumulated savings to their incomes, and they would not then go on saving out of income. In an economy with a constant quantity of money, ultimately, people would stop saving out of money income. Profits would be all consumed. Profits would be generated only by net consumption. The wage earners would have sufficient accumulated savings so that they did not need to add to their savings each year. You save out of income in order to build up your accumulated savings, to provide some provision for the future, to achieve a certain balance. What perpetuates saving out of income year after year is the fact that the quantity of money and volume of spending continually rise. So imagine you would be happy, or the average wage earner would be happy, let's assume, if he could achieve accumulated savings equal to five times his income. Imagine how that would affect people's attitude toward consumption. I'm making $25,000 a year, I've got $125,000 in the bank. How could I feel about consuming out of my income? I could afford to. If I have no savings in that income, then I need to save. All right, if we had a constant quantity of money, the level of money income stabilizes, people would accumulate capital up to a certain point and then stop. Physical capital accumulation would continue, real wealth would grow, but it would take the form of falling prices. Each year's replacement funds of business would buy more and more. Each year, the same monetary amounts of accumulated savings and capital would represent more and more real wealth. But people would not perpetually be raising the ratio of their savings and capital to their consumption. They'd achieve a certain balance, and that would be it. I will now allow for the fact that money and spending increase. We start out, you've got accumulated savings equal to five times your income and now your income has grown 2%. Well, if you want to maintain the same balance, what do you have to do to your accumulated savings? You'll have to increase them to maintain the same balance. And having to increase your accumulated savings means you'll have to go on saving. If you stopped the increase in the quantity of money, saving out of 
money income would also stop. We'd have a, a sufficiently high ratio, and the significance of, of saving and capital would be seen not as a percentage of saving out of net income, it would be seen in terms of the saving out of gross revenue, productive expenditure relative to sales. It would be in terms of the ratio of accumulated capital to sales. Now, I know th th this can't be too clear. It would take a lot more going into. I just want to indicate uh, what is uh, actually required for progress. Saving year after year in terms of money is a product of the increase in the quantity of money. And notice the saving that is made out of profit each year is actually made out of a rate of profit that is elevated by the increase in the quantity of money. I explained how the increase in money adds a positive component to the rate of profit. So all the saving that's taking place out of the rate of profit is out of a rate that is elevated. All right, well, hopefully uh, this may be enough to indicate that there is no problem of an excess of savings. When, there, when a depression occurs, it is not because the consumers have decided to save. That has never been the cause of a depression. If they were, in fact, saving, business conditions would be easier. You don't have bankruptcies, the inability to obtain funds when savings are, re are readily available. It's not necessary that the consumers be spending every last penny that they receive. Actually, we could have uh, the economy being profitable even if uh, sales revenues were less than productive spending, even if the consumers wanted to save a huge chunk of their income. What that would mean is business would produce fewer consumer goods, they'd devote the labor and capital goods to more capital-intensive projects. Let's imagine, for example, uh, for one year, everybody decided to go on a diet of bread and water. <clears throat> and that was all they were going to spend their money on, and they were going to save 90% uh, of their income. Now, would this mean that business has to go bankrupt because it's selling so little? No, it wouldn't. What it would mean is that for a year, business would not have to produce very much consumer goods. But is there anything useful that could be produced with all of the labor and capital goods other than those consumer goods? How about using that labor and capital goods to make everything much more capital intensive? Maybe build a tunnel from Japan to South Korea, since we didn't have to produce the consumer goods that year. And now after that's done, and people now have this accumulated savings, then they're in a position in which they can afford to consume more. So then consumer spending will pick up. But the fact that it uh, shuts off for a while is uh, not critical. What produces a depression is not that the consumers say, we're not spending. The depressions originate in business, not uh, through the consumers not spending. And, uh, to indicate very quickly what the issue is. If in years before this, you have an easy money policy and it's easy to borrow money profitably, then people become less conservative in terms of how much money they want to hold. They get overcommitted. They operate with too low cash holdings. They invest every last penny. Instead of holding cash, they're spending every last amount they can for investment or consumption in the conviction that they can borrow easily and profitably. Well, what happens when the banking system decides it can't go on creating loans out of new and additional money? It has to stop or at least slow the process. Well, then there are people who are counting on borrowing who can't borrow. There are firms that were lenders. They need to keep their funds internally. You get a so-called credit crunch. Then people want to hold the money tightly and then consumers stop spending. That's a derivative. The uh, critical problem is, first, uh, business becomes illiquid because of credit expansion. It's not a problem that the consumers are consuming too little. That's just nonsense. 
Uh, if you think about uh, saving and spending, just ask, uh, where does the demand, for, what makes possible the demand for expensive consumer goods, like housing, automobiles? How do we even get the money to buy these things? Credit. From saving. An individual gets it from credit, but what stands behind the credit? Saving. Saving is the foundation of most of the spending in the economy. All of the spending for expensive consumer goods, all of the spending for capital goods, the wages paid by business. All right, so depressions are, are not, in fact, a result of any problem of saving. All right, I hope uh, I've, I've made that point uh, sufficient. Uh, I regret not having a seventh lecture to really do these matters justice. Instead of my taking the last uh, few minutes to summarize, you have a written summary in front of you, uh, which can do the job as well, or almost as well as I could. Uh, I'd like to take just a few minutes to uh, turn to the wider issue, to wider issues, uh, not in economics, but uh, pertaining to this conference and uh, to objectivism and to where I think we stand. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to say uh, I've been tremendously pleased with this conference. Uh, I think it's one of the very best we've had, possibly the best. There have been some truly outstanding lectures, uh, which I know I've learned a great deal from. I've been also very, very happy uh, in uh, meeting many of, of the people attending the conference, and it's making me very optimistic for the future, for the future of objectivism and uh, our culture. I look around and I see certain people maybe in their late 20s, their early or mid 30s in professions, and they have really serious interests, and uh, they're reading major tomes and studying uh, difficult subjects earnestly, and I see many, many others uh, who are taking ideas very seriously. What I'm seeing here that I think is uh, almost non-existent anywhere else is a combination of a uh, high level of intelligence and articulateness combined with genuine enthusiasm for ideas and values. I don't think that that combination exists uh, virtually anywhere else today. It used to exist. Uh, 50 or 75 years ago, the intelligent young professionals and businessmen, they would be joining possibly the Communist Party or various socialist organizations. That, I think, is totally dead. And they're dispirited. They think reason doesn't work because that was their view of reason. But here, I think we have people who uh, take ideas and values seriously. I think we have uh, highly intelligent people who are uh, genuinely committed to uh, values and ideas. That is the rarest, most vital commodity. And uh, in terms of, of that group, if you look at who in the society is intelligent and committed in terms of values, in that very, very critical area, however small and ineffectual we may presently be, I think we may now have a majority. There may only be a couple of dozen of us, or 50, or whatever. But that's more than uh, you'll find uh, on the other side. And this is like... <laughs> this is like the first turning. I don't know. Maybe it's like the 12th derivative. <laughs> of, <laughs> but it's got to add up as time goes on. And I think 
there, there's been incredible in print and development over the period of time that I can remember. Uh, Harry Binswanger always reminds me that I used to say you could gather all the world's advocates of capitalism into one uh, not very large living room at one time. <clears throat> well, that's certainly changed. And I think that we, we have some slight 12th derivative momentum uh, developing on our side. And what's required is that everyone who seriously wants to advance our cause has to make himself uh, more knowledgeable, more educated, and articulate. And basically, we then just have to find other people who are intelligent and articulate and who can be motivated, and then who will do the same. It's a process of uh, philosophical growth. At present, we're in the state of Japan of 1950. And we have to get into a mode whereby a year or five years from now, we can be a few percent ahead of where we are now, and then we can accomplish more than we can do now. Uh, on campus, we've had uh, a valuable uh, unofficial program with various organizations that are doing good work. In e each of these organizations, whatever battles or campaigns they undertake, it really doesn't matter if they win any particular objective. If they speak from sound philosophy and advance the right principles, they'll reach some people who will be attracted by the right principles, who can then be exposed to the whole philosophy, and who will then uh, become deeper in it and more articulate. And then you've got the basis for conducting action on a wider scale in the future. Uh, as we proceed, we'll develop, uh, in my prejudice of, as an economist, we'll pick up important economies of scale. Now, here and there, you might have an isolated objectivist professor in a college. And the students come to his classes. They may be impressed for a while, but they lose it because they're overwhelmed elsewhere. And many of them can write him off as a kook. Why doesn't everyone else agree? <clears throat> Maybe with two, they could avoid the influence of two. But project that there were three objectivist professors teaching at the same university, and students got a triple exposure. Well, then you'd start gaining large numbers. You'd go, you'd have a, a quantum leap in development. So I think uh, in the next, within the next generation, we'll start to see that. Let me just close by saying uh, the way uh, I view the role of TJS, what I'd like to uh, concentrate on to the extent possible, and I'm constantly considering how it can be done, uh, I'd like TJS to play a significant role in helping people who do want to understand ideas in depth and be able to articulate them. I'd like, uh, in some way, for us to be able to help promote that to the best extent we can. And uh, I'm constantly working on that. And, and as I develop a solution, I'll be sure to let you all know about it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, what am I doing? <laughs> Anticlimactic. <laughs> now I first have to answer questions. All right, let's start with uh, some from the floor. Yes, uh, Mr. Crawford. We like to put all this together in a book, George. Oh, thank you. We're going to put all this together in a book. <laughs> Essentially, I have. And now I'm making uh, revisions and improvements. And uh, the chapter that I'm currently revising is the one uh, on the material uh, we've been discussing in these uh, six lectures. 
and uh, I'll be revising it more or less to conform with the way I've presented the material. And since uh, I view you as a potential market, <laughs> let me tell you that this is as difficult as it gets. There's nothing that is any more difficult than the material that we've gone over in these six lectures. Uh, the book is presently the equivalent of 2,000 double-spaced type pages. Uh, you've seen the excerpt. Uh, it's about 750 of those kinds of pages. Uh, I hope to have uh, a final draft within a matter of months, allow somewhat for slippage since uh, such things sometimes don't work out, but it is very close. Yes, Mr. Campbell. Yes, you've made several remarks about uh, your disagreements with Rothbard's system. I'm wondering whether your book will contain a full critique. Will my book contain a full critique of Rothbard? Not a full critique, but uh, here and there, the the one person that I single out for criticism wherever possible, at, with quotations, is Samuelson. <clears throat> and then I try to use Rothbard as second uh, where appropriate. Yeah. Um, listening to your lect lectures, I've been impressed that uh, your, the ideas you convey are in large part due to good, um, application of good accounting principles. To what degree is the failure of contemporary economics due to bad economics? Are you saying, uh, the question is, uh, much of the value of what I'm saying, uh, of what I'm saying uh, reflects uh, adherence to sound accounting principles. And uh, I'm sorry, I missed the second point. To what degree is contemporary economics a failure uh, to what extent is, are the problems of contemporary economics the result of a failure to apply sound accounting principles? Well, you can view it at the level of accounting principles, and that does make a big difference, following sound accounting versus not. But accounting, sound accounting follows reality. And I think uh, what stops contemporary economics from following sound accounting and reality uh, are those confusions I went into in the first two lectures it's confused views on entities, blurring uh, expenditures together. I think it's uh, a platonic Heracleitian view of entities that they have. And on the other hand, sound accounting and I and classical economics have an Aristotelian view of entities. Uh, in the last row. Uh, I, uh, I'm curious, uh, in 1893, I read there was a, uh, almost a depression in this country. In 1893, uh, there was a depression. I don't know if that was the particular year, but certainly around that time. And there were many other major depressions in the 19th century. There was a depression in 1819, in 1837, I think 1853 or 56, a whole series, 1873. And your question is, how could that occur with a gold-backed currency? Well, we had a gold-backed currency, but it was always a fractional reserve gold standard. That meant that uh, throughout our history, uh, gold represented part of the money supply, but the banking system issued notes and deposits far in excess of the gold that it held. Uh, for example, a bank would have checking deposits of $10 million, but the actual amount of gold that it possessed was $2 million, and it had $8 million of assets in the form of IOUs. So most of the money was not backed by gold, but by debt. And then whenever some substantial debtors would go broke, some banks would go broke, their checking deposits ceased to have the character of money that was deflation. The uh, cause of depressions was not a gold system, but the fact that it was a fractional reserve gold standard. The kind of gold standard that I advocate is a 100% gold reserve system, which means when gold money comes into existence, nothing can take it out of existence. There's nothing that will reduce the quantity of money, 
There's nothing that first uh, elevates the volume of spending by depressing the desire to hold money. If you have a slowly increasing gold money, people want to hold the money. They don't start uh, getting illiquid by spending too heavily. And then they're not set up to have to contract. Uh, Mr. Dunn. Uh, system that existed at that time a product of government intervention or was it a free market uh, phenomenon? Uh, you're asking, was the fractional reserve system that existed in the 19th century a product of government intervention or a, uh, the product of the free market? I think uh, it was uh, very heavily a product of government intervention. Uh, every time the government uh, does anything to instill confidence in fractional reserve banks uh, by having bank examinations, uh, restricting competition among banks, uh, that promotes fractional reserve banking. Now, I think a good case could be made out that fractional reserve deposit banking, I'm not talking about savings, bankings, savings banking. When you put money in a savings account, you know that you're giving up the right to spend it. You can't spend the money you put in a savings account. If that money is then lent out, that's fine. The borrower is borrowing savings. The 100% reserve applies simply to checking deposits and bank notes. Now there, I think a good case can be made out that uh, a fractional reserve is fraudulent and merely uh, for the government to allow it is to encourage it. If I put money in a checking account and I continue to have the right to write checks, I haven't given up my money. I still have my money. And if that money is lent and I've still got it to spend, there's something wrong here. It's the equivalent of my putting uh, whiskey in a bonded warehouse and the warehouse running at a fractional reserve. Now, you could argue, suppose the bank tells me, and I do this voluntarily. Well, as I said the other day, I think narcotics should be legal, so I would have to say that uh, fractional reserve banking should be legal. But I think it ought to be clear that when people put money in a fractional reserve checking deposit, they should understand that they do not have their money, they're in a position of granting a loan. And do they want to grant a loan? Do you want to be paid with what is not money but a loan? If people want to be paid with what is a loan and they understand it, fine. But even then, I would say the government should not be making loans to anyone. If the government is paid, it should not accept loans as payment. Whenever the government is paid anything, the government should not be granting credit to anybody. They should demand full payment, which would mean payment in 100% gold. And if that were done, the uh, fractional reserve banking system, I don't think, could have uh, significant existence. Uh, the gentleman in the last row. I have a question about the increasing degree of debt capitalization going on right now. Yeah. Uh, it's unclear, or it's hard to tell how much of that debt could uh, realistically be repaid in the future and how much is pure speculation. Uh, what's your view on how precarious the economy appears to you? Are you saying you're concerned about the extent, uh, the magnitude of debt, and uh, is it payable? Right. All right. Uh, I'm not as expert on that uh, matter as Dr. Zenholtz, but. Uh, I know we do have an enormous volume of debt, and this volume of debt, I think, is uh, incompatible, the ability to pay this volume of debt is incompatible with any kind of modest increase in the quantity of money. If the quantity of money grows modestly, then the growth in sales, revenues, and incomes will be modest, and people just can't pay the level of interest and principal they now have to pay. So in my judgment, the only way that the present volume of debt can be payable is if there is some substantial rate of increase in the quantity of money. 
if there is not a substantial rate of increase for a, pro a protracted period of time, then we have the possibility of universal bankruptcy. So uh, I think that's an enormous potential problem. Dr. Mode? About uh, 10 years ago, uh, Henry Hazlitt pointed out that, that there was a gross misunderstanding on the part of the American public of the ratio of corporate aggregate net profit to aggregate uh, pay, corporate payrolls. He said most people think that about 80% goes to the stockholders and about 20% to the employees, and this aided and abetted the Marxists in their contention that the workers are being exploited. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hazel pointed out that, in fact, that the ratio was just about exactly in reverse. My question is two-part. A, do you happen to know what the, the current ratio is, approximately? And number two, has anybody put together a booklet or a book on all the various shibboleths like that, which are uh, widely believed but false? Okay, do I happen to know uh, what is the proportion of profits relative to wages? And uh, has anybody put out a booklet uh, which would provide that kind of information and correct information uh, to answer many other fallacies? Uh, profits, if, if you express it in terms of a percentage of total incomes, if we add all wages and all profits uh, together and interest, the uh, profits and interest together amount to something on the order of 20% of the total, and wages and salaries on the order of 80%. And then some substantial portion of the profit and interest is saved and invested if we compared the consumption by the businessmen and capitalists to that of the wage earners, the ratio is probably on the order of 1 to 10. Uh, some people have, made, have, have disseminated this knowledge, but obviously uh, not too successfully. I don't know of any one particular booklet that would uh, rebut such fallacies. Uh, Hazlitt's book, is uh, Emics in One Lesson, is the best systematic answer to fallacies, but obviously it can't answer all of them. Yes, Mr. Kim. Um, I understand that uh, the economic growth that, that Japan has experienced in the last 40 years, please correct me if I'm wrong, uh, was a lot of the company's growth was based on debt financing. Now, how does that compare to our debt financing of our economy today? And, and to what degree will that affect our growth compared you to how the Japanese grew? Right, you say you understand that a lot of the growth of Japanese companies was based on debt financing. Yeah, they, they use debt financing lar a larger percentage of their growth, more so than, say, equity financing that we do here in the United States. All right, and that you understand that they use debt financing uh, more heavily there than here. Uh, I'm not an expert on uh, Japanese financial statistics, but a priori, I would uh, be very, very doubtful of that idea. I could understand it uh, in the very beginning of some companies, but notice the Japanese companies are enormously successful. And these companies have very high profits, and they are saving and reinvesting the profits. So I think it's the reinvestment of profits which is really the main source. And if you look over an economy as a whole, those individual companies that do use debt financing, the debt has to come from somewhere. Now, if the debt is properly based, it will come from the savings of others, which will be, to, uh, to a very large degree, the profits of other firms. For example, uh, Toyota may not use all of its profits to expand automobile production. They might put a substantial portion in uh, time deposits or whatever, uh, and then uh, someone goes and borrows the time deposits. But the ultimate source is the profit of Toyota. The only way that profits would not be the main base would be if Japan had been uh, following a policy of credit expansion, of the banking system 
creating new and additional money out of thin air, but they would not have been able to have success on that foundation. So I would go back and double check uh, the statistics. Uh, Mr. Hattab. Uh, when the U.S. had a fractional reserve system in the 19th century, was there any country possessing a full gold, re gold reserve system? And wouldn't this discrepancy, if it existed, tend to result in gold funds moving from the fractional country to the full gold system? Or would the natural rate of interest in the fractional system have to be higher to hold the gold in that system? Okay, the question is, uh, in the 19th century, and also in the 20th century, uh, was there any country that had a 100% reserve gold system? Uh, to my knowledge, no. Uh, some of the major banks that began in the world, like the Bank of Amsterdam, uh, originally began as a 100% reserve bank, but I believe that was back in the 17th century. Uh, the banks uh, have been fractional reserve banks. It's just a difference of degree whether it's 50% or 25% or 15%. Now, if you had a country with a 100% gold reserve or any individual bank within a country that had a 100% gold reserve, it would draw gold from the other banks. Uh, let's simply imagine, and, and th this, this principle applies now uh, to the reserves they presently use. Uh, imagine, for example, that Bank of America decides to create a billion dollars of additional deposits which it lends to various borrowers. And this is all that happens. Uh, these borrowers now start writing checks. Most of the checks they write will not go to other customers of Bank of America, some will, but most of them will go to customers of Chase Manhattan or Security Pacific or uh, Sanwa Bank or whatever. And these banks then have checks drawn on Bank of America, which they'll present for collection, and Bank of America will not have nearly as many checks drawn on them. So when they present those checks for collection, Bank of America has to pay with its reserves. If the reserve was gold, Bank of America would lose gold. Uh, if we have all the banks in one country expanding and banks in another country not, the banks in the other country will present the checks to the expanding banks and they'll have to be paid. Well, this explains the movement of reserves. Uh, anytime you find a country that complains that it's running out of reserves, foreign currency reserves, like let's say uh, Argentina uh, has very limited foreign currency reserves or, or any country that's creating money. Its citizens have more money. They start spending it. The money comes into the possession of foreigners. They don't want the money of that country. They want an internationally usable money. So if Argentina has dollars, they'll ask for dollars. And then the Argentine central bank gets drained of its dollars. Well, the practical implication of this uh, in a gold standard is uh, the more conservative banks would be able to limit the rate of expansion of the less conservative banks. If we had some significant group of banks that were 100% reserve banks, they would be able to sh uh, severely limit the expansion of uh, any other banks. Uh, Mr. Blair. Yes, uh, what parallels are there between the principles of a productive economy in terms of capital spending and consumer spending and the principles of leading a productive life? If you wouldn't mind uh, using some examples from your own life, could you uh, point out some occasions where you made a capital expenditure, as it were, that led to your own life being more productive? Well, instead of trying to give personal examples, let me stick to the basic principle <clears throat> Uh, what can one do in one's own life uh, analogous to capital formation in economic life? Like, how could you uh, become a personal Japan, in effect? <clears throat> well, I think uh, the basic principle is uh, devote 
a substantial portion of your energies to self-improvement. If you uh, devote your time and effort to building up your skills, then you're going to be capable of doing greater things, including developing still better skills. An example I once gave, you know, it's so simple. Uh, when you've learned arithmetic, now you have the basis for learning algebra. And then you have the basis for learning calculus. Well, if an individual devotes a sufficient proportion of his time and effort to self-development, as he proceeds, he becomes a better, more capable individual. And plus, if he could do this more efficiently, uh, many of us may have different problems that make, may make our thinking somewhat inefficient, or we waste time, or we're blocked by being compulsive, or whatever. <clears throat> to whatever extent, we could tackle those problems and improve the results we can achieve with any given amount of time and devote more of that time to learning and uh, improving our abilities, well, then that's how we grow. Thank you. And, all right, I'll give you a personal example. Uh, uh, I grew uh, in my own by grinding my jaws on von Mises and the classical economists in economics. And of course, I've uh, greatly gained from reading Atlas Shrugged and uh, Ayn Rand. I'm not a professional philosopher, however, and perhaps in the years to come, now that I think I've done mainly what I wanted to do in economics, I will uh, try to achieve a higher level of development in philosophy. Yes, Mr. Trader. No, there isn't the Swiss franc backed by 100% gold. Uh, the, the Swiss government does not have any obligation to redeem Swiss francs for any gold. There is no uh, official gold parity of the franc. It's an irredeemable paper money. Now, what is true is that there's a large amount of gold physically held in Switzerland. And if you divided that physical quantity of gold by the number of Swiss francs, there'd be a high ratio. But that th is not in any sense backing for the currency. Well, I have to impose a limitation on myself of just taking one more question. <clears throat> yes, Mrs. Hurwitz. Can you tell us some about the market for your book, since most people are neither objectivists or frequently don't consider economics? Pleasure reading. What is the market? What is the market for my book? Uh, since, did you say most people who are objectivists uh, don't consider economics no. pleasure reading? Most people are neither oh, since most people are neither objectivists and many of those who are don't consider economics. Are. Uh, who are. And who are, I'm sorry, also. Uh, most people are not objectivists and don't consider economics uh, pleasure reading. Well, uh, the market will uh, necessarily be limited. Hopefully, uh, here and there, someone might use it as a textbook. Uh, anyone who has a serious interest in the subject, I think, uh, would buy it. Those who are presently uh, trying to use Rothbard as an introduction to economics, I think uh, that should be a market. They should read this instead. Uh, anyone who wants to, who's read Hazlitt and who wants to go a step up, I think that would be a market. I don't see a really mass market, but uh, there should be a market to that extent. Well, thank you again.